The title of the message this morning is The One Who Shares the One. Um, we've looked at the one and the fact that there's only one, and he reminds us over and over again that there are no other gods besides him. We see that in so many places throughout the Old Testament. Uh, then we looked at the one who found the one, and the fact that when Jesus Christ comes into our life, he changes everything. Amen? All of our future changes, our past that we've went through, it becomes new. So the old things are passed away, all things become new. Everything changes when Jesus Christ comes into our life. And uh, today we're going to look at the one who shares the one. And uh, we're talking about the Christmas season, and we're talking about the opportunity that we have to talk about the purpose behind Christmas. It's not just to sit around a tree and open presents, although it's kind of wonderful. And uh, I can remember as, as uh, younger parents when our kids were little, and uh, you spend this money on a toy, and it's like they sat there and played with the box. And it's like, come on, really? But you know what? It's not about the presents, is it? It's about Jesus Christ coming to this earth and giving his life for us. And so that's what we concentrate on. So today we're going to look at the one who shares the one. Where to start? Um, there were a million thoughts running through my brain as I was thinking through today's message this week. A million thoughts. Things like, why don't we share the gospel like we should? If we were to go around every, and talk to everybody in this room, I'm sure we could come up with quite a few reasons as to why we don't share the gospel as we should. I mean, we know that it's all about the one, right? And we say this all the time, it's all about the one, it's not about me, it's all about him. And we know that we should be sharing our faith, but why don't we do it? You know, I have a million things running through my mind concerning that. Certainly we've heard numerous messages on that subject. Can we agree on that? Right, right. So if you've been in church at all throughout your life, you've heard that you're supposed to be sharing the gospel, sharing with others what Jesus Christ has done for you. Um, another question, what justification or justifications, plural, might we have as we stand before God as to why we didn't share the gospel? I mean, I mean, would it be like things like, well, I'm just too shy? And God says, oh, okay, I'll give you a buy on that one. You know, I, I get it, you're shy. No, no worry. Don't you worry about it. You know, is God going to say, is God going to say that? What, what, what justification do we really have as for not sharing the gospel? You know, well, I forget what to say, God. I mean, certainly, you know, I don't have a good memory. I mean, I can't, I mean, goodness, Lord, I can't even remember the people I, I met yesterday. I don't even know their name. I just walked away from them. Certainly, how do you expect me to remember a bunch of Bible verses, right? Is that going to be a great justification as we stand before God? Wow, it's getting a little quiet in here. Like, nobody's responding. Okay, I'll just go. <laughs> it's reality, isn't it? It's reality check for all of us, right? Uh, and I want you to know, as, uh, as, uh, where, where's Dave Havens today? Where is he? I saw him earlier. <laughs> two hands and a foot. I love it when Dave says, I got, I'm just like pastor, two hands and a foot. I got to stand on something, but I mean, it's very little. What will we have as a justifiable excuse as we stand before God? Can we say, well, I'm afraid. I mean, Lord, you understand, I'm, I'm kind of afraid to open my mouth and talk about religious things. You know, people are going to think I'm a holier than thou. What excuses might be valid? Things like, well, I haven't been trained very well, right? I mean, we can all say, well, I just haven't had the training that I feel like I need to really share the gospel effectively. And God say, hey, great excuse, no worries. Uh, I'm not sure that one will pass either. Or, uh, um... I don't know how to do it very well. I, I mean, it just comes back to that training thing. I, I just don't know how to do it. Um, maybe it's just wrong philosophy, such as, well, my faith is very personal. I mean, I don't, I don't really want to get in anybody else's business about their faith, and I don't want really anybody coming into my business about my faith. It's just really personal. And because I believe it's personal, I just don't get into that conversation. And God says, hey, that's a good one. Hadn't heard that one before. Right? Or uh, things like, well, they, they will think I'm just better than them if I start talking to them about their faith. They'll think I'm better than them. And then it's actually going to close the door, and it's not going to be very effective, so I just don't say anything. That way we just don't rock the boat. We're still friends, and we're just all good. You ever have those thoughts? I have those thoughts. I don't know about you, but I used, people used to say, well, Ken, you can talk to anybody. 
I mean, anybody, but, you know, yeah, there's some of us that have never met a stranger, and we can talk to anybody. I mean, there's a guy behind us at Wegmans, never saw him before, but, man, we're having a conversation like we've known each other all our lives, right? I mean, there are people who have that personality, and then there are other people who's like, I hope he's not looking at me, because if he looks at me, I might have to talk to him, and I really don't want to look at him, so I really don't want a conversation. I don't know who he is, and I'm just going to try to avoid him, pretend he's not seeing me. There's that side, too. But where... In our personality, do we say, well, I just have it all together, so therefore I'm equipped to do this. I think a lot of things run through a lot of our minds. And I'm thinking, where do you start with this? Because it's an important issue. It's an important subject. It's an important part of our obedience as a follower of Christ, right? We know that life is all about the one. He said, there's no other God beside me. And then we find that one and he he changes our lives. But here's what I find. The longer we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, for many people, the less they talk about him. And here's why. I said it last week and I'm going to say it again. We come into a service. The announcement is made about what we're going to hear about today. You may even turn to that passage and say, well, and in our minds, I've heard that one before. And we kind of go into coast mode. It's true. And trust me, there's sometimes I'm sitting on that side as I go to a pastor's conference or a pastor's fellowship or something. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, he didn't even touch this issue about that passage. And he didn't talk about this about that passage. And why didn't he touch that one? That's just obvious. And you know what I'm not doing? Listening to what he is saying. I think all of us are guilty of that to some extent. So I'm just baffled as to why we, why I don't share our faith as a body of believers when we claim to know him and to claim that he has changed our lives. Why don't we talk about him? I mean, we talk about sports. We talk about the weather. We talk about what's going on in the news. We talk about what's happening at work. We talk about what's happening in our grandkids' lives. But why don't we talk about God? Man, I can hear the fans whistling. Woo! But it's true, isn't it? It's true. So let's think about this just for a moment. Do we honestly not care whether or not others come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior? Do we not care whether or not someone, a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, a cousin, a relative, a co-worker, a friend, a neighbor, whatever, do we honestly not care? I think if we were to pin us down, we'd say, well, yeah, I really do care. I want my neighbor to know Jesus. I want my friend to know Jesus. I want my co-worker. But then why don't we put action to it? Why don't we do that? The reality is, is that if we don't open our mouth, there's a possibility that God will not use us in, in, in allowing us to be a blessing to share the, share the plan of salvation with someone, but we may miss the opportunity to receive that blessing. We may miss an opportunity to see them come to know, know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the reality of that is that they will spend eternity in hell. We have a greatest message ever been given. What do we do with it? In Luke chapter 6, verses Verse 46 says, Why do you call me Lord and don't do the things I say? That's a valid question. Why do you call me Lord and then don't do what I ask you to do? Am I really your Lord? Because if, if, if I am your Lord, then I expect you to do what I ask you to do. If we are our parents, and those of us who have experienced parenthood, when we tell our kids to do something, we expect what? That they're going to do it. Right. Why would it be any different with our Heavenly Father when He tells us to do something and He looks down at us and says, well, I love you, Lord, but why aren't you doing what I'm asking you to do? And then we go back to that list of all the excuses and justifications and pull one of them out and say, this one today. In James chapter 4, verse 17, it says, so it is a sin for a person who knows to do what is good and doesn't do it. There's another reality. Is that God says that I'm living in sin if I know that I'm supposed to do something good and I don't do it. When I read that this week, I'm thinking to myself, man, I am a sinful person. Because there's things that I should be doing that I'm not very good at. Not very effective at. Things I'm not very consistent at. I need to work on these things. 
And God says, it's sin if you know what to do and you're not doing it. You say, well, I'm afraid. I, I just don't know what to say. Acts 1.8 says what? But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is what? Come upon you. And you shall be what? Witnesses. He says, I've equipped you to do what I've asked you to do. Will you do it? In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Well, I, you know, people you know, might think that I'm more spiritual than them. They might think I'm a holy roller. They might think that I'm just trying to be better than them. I'm goody two shoes, whatever the case may be. And Paul comes out and says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's the gospel. And we cannot be ashamed of it if we are going to see the world come to know Jesus Christ. I was reading an article yesterday. By a, by a man in uh, New Mexico who wrote a really decent article about everybody in the, in the world as we know it receiving the gospel. He said if everybody would share their faith and put, the practice, put into practice the principles of multiplication, everybody on planet earth could hear the gospel in 37 years. Think about that. You say, well, that's 37 years. Right, but 37 years hearing how many billion people to know hear the, hear the plan of salvation. And it all starts with you and I, each and every one of us, saying, I'll share my story. I thought to myself, that's pretty cool. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, he says this, Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Now think about this for a moment. He is praying that when he opens his mouth, that with boldness he would share the gospel. How many of us have actually prayed that prayer? Uh, let me just tell you, just so you know, so we're all on the same page this morning. I'm not preaching at you. I'm not preaching over your heads. I'm one of you sitting in the pew. Okay, nice padded seats. <laughs> I put myself there. I need to start praying that prayer more often. That I, with boldness would open my mouth and make known the mystery of the gospel. What is it that we pray for? I can tell you what I pray for. I pray for a lot of stuff. But I can tell you what I don't pray enough for is that God would give me boldness and pray for those opportunities. I need to do it more. Maybe you do too. And then he says, verse 20, and I think this is the why behind it. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Get that word picture in your mind. An ambassador in chains. Just kind of conjure in your mind a picture of what that might look like. An ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough in him to speak as I should. Silently answer this question. Do I pray for boldness to speak as we know we should? My goodness, that's... that's, that's... <clears throat> There's a knife in the chest. And now he says, as I should, and he goes, ooh, you know, and he kind of twists it a little bit, and he says, am I doing that right? Because that's a reality for all of us, I think. Anybody agree? See, we know the truth. We've been set free. If we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, we're on our way to heaven, not just as a get-out-of-hell escape card, but as, a re as one coming to Him in a, with a relationship with Him, walking in fellowship with Him. And he says, why wouldn't you want to not, not want to bring others with you? So, kind of four questions came to my mind. Four questions to consider this morning. Number one, why is it important to share my faith? Well, I think God's Word makes those answers very clear. So we're going to look at several points under number one. Why is it important that I share my faith? Number one, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Actually, I want to look at verses 18 through 20. It says, Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And here's the action word here in verse 19. Go. And literally, as it means, as you are going about your day-to-day -day activities, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, to observe everything I've commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. The first reason that we consider this is that because God has told us to go. 
And He has told us to reproduce ourselves. He has told us to share the Gospel. He has told us to, to win the world, to disciple them. And before we can disciple them, they first have to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? So that means we have to open our mouth. We have to talk about what Jesus Christ has done to us in our lives so that we can get them to the place that they will begin to reproduce themselves in the lives of others. The first reason we do it is because God says to do it. He says to go. And then he goes on in Mark chapter 12. And we call that the Great Commission. You've been commissioned to share your faith and to make disciples. And in Mark chapter 12, and beginning with verse uh, 28, he says this. One of the scribes approached when he went uh, approach when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well. He asked him, "Which command is the most important of all?" He says, "This is the most important." Jesus answered, "Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these." And when we think about that, that's what we call the great command. There's a great commission and there's a great commandment. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. You say, well, what, what do these two things have to prove? What, what, why are they tied together? Well, God told us to go and do something. He gave us a command to obey. And here's what He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You say, well, how do these two tie together? Well, John, Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 15, He says, if you love Me, you will keep My commands. So God says here, I've given you a command to go reach the world that you live in. And He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, with all your being. And He says, by the way, if you love Me, you will keep this command and other commands. So really it comes down to our own obedience before God. It is an obedience issue. It's not an issue of whether or not you think you're equipped, although equipping helps. It's not a, a matter of whether or not you think you can remember everything you're supposed to say, although that would help. We have the Holy Spirit to bring those things to remembrance. It's not about whether or not I have a, a personality that is outgoing or a personality that is shy, though it does, it, it does work into the equation. It is ultimately an issue of obedience. And the same obedience that we expect out of our children, God expects out of us as His children. It's an issue of obedience. And He says, if you love Me, you will keep My commands. What's the command that we're looking at? Sharing your faith. It comes down to obedience. Will we not be effective at carrying out the Great Commission if we are not effective at loving God? If you don't love Him, you'll never love others enough to share uh, something that could change your eternal destiny. Love precedes action. Think about that. Before I will begin to serve somebody completely and wholeheartedly, I have to first love them. Love precedes action. And as I say often in my own personal definition of love, love is a decision that results in an action and does not expect anything in return. Love is a decision that results in an action and expects nothing in return. That's love. And God says, if you love me, you'll, you'll keep my commandments. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Hell is the reality of those without Christ. Say the word hell. Hell. No, say it, say it. Hell. Anybody enjoy saying that word? It's a hard word to say, isn't it? It really is. We don't like how that comes out of our mouth. But it's a real place, and it's a reality for those outside of Christ. That ought to wake us up. That ought to make us think twice about our faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 4, He says, in their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We have a message that could change the world. And they don't 
understand that they even don't understand it. Think about that. So the gods of this world, what are the gods of this world? Just answer that question in your mind. Money, power, position, status, fill in the blank. These things cloud focus. They cloud their ability to think what is most important. So the gods of this world, maybe you're, maybe we as believers are clouded by our gods as well. You say, oh God, Pastor, we don't, we don't have gods. I don't have anything that I'm bound down to. I have no idols in my life. I would venture to say maybe some of us do. Really. See, anything that we give more time, attention, and focus to has a potential of being an idol in our life. Could be family. Could be a job. Could be a hobby. Could be anything. Could be a relationship. Could be our desires. Could be the things of this world. Could be any number of things. But if we're giving more time, attention, and focus to those things than we are God, you say, well, I have to have a job. And I have to work so I can provide for my family. Wonderful. Those are all biblical things. It's not wrong to have things. It's wrong for things to have you. And when things have you, it clouds your focus and become idols in your life. Regardless of what they may be. The reality is, we should have no other gods. We talked about that week one. Most of the unsaved don't know that they need Jesus Christ. Because their minds have been darkened. Their minds have been blinded. Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians in chapter 5. And I want to read the beginning of verse 17. This is verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And look, new things have come. Everything is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Stop right there just for a moment. He says, if you know Jesus Christ, you've been reconciled to God. And now that you've been reconciled to God, He says, I've given you the ministry of reconciliation so that you can help others be reconciled to God. You get what he's saying here? It's called multiplication here. It's the idea of that I've received something and now I've been given the authority to give it away. Not just the authority to, but the command to. He says, you've been reconciled, now reconcile others to God. So let's go on here. Verse 19, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and as he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. So now he says, you've been commissioned. And here's how. Verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Certain that God is appealing through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, and he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that we might be the, become the righteousness of God in him. So God says, you have been given authority. We all know what an ambassador is. Think about our ambassadors to the United Nations, our ambassadors to other countries. They are going with a message on our behalf, right? You have been given a message on Christ's behalf to share with the world. He says, you've been reconciled, and now help others be reconciled to God. Let me ask you a question. Let's just be honest. Is this an option? No. no. Okay, so... So it's, we're on the same page here. We all have the same commission. We have all, if we know Jesus Christ, been given ambassadorship. We have all given, been given a message. What will we do with it? What will we do with it? Matthew chapter 9, if you would turn there. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 and 37. <clears throat> Verse 36 says, When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Let me stop right there for a moment. Don't look at verse, the next verse yet. 
You know what the difference between compassion and empathy is? Action. You say, well, I'm, I have a comp I'm compassionate towards the lost. I'm compassionate towards the sick. I'm compassionate towards those who are less fortunate. Let me just tell you, compassion without action is just empathy. You're empathetic towards them. Which one accomplishes something? Empathy or compassion? Compassion does. You ever heard of Compassion International? It'd be an amazing thing if they would just say, man, we got all these pockets of children all around the world who need help. They're without water, they're without food, or they're without nutrients. Some of them are orphaned and they don't have homes, they don't have parents. Some of them are really going through sickness and illness and they have no, no one to care for them. Okay. And you walk away and say, well, man, I've just been told this information, but I didn't, wasn't given an opportunity to do anything about it. Would Compassion International be compassion it if they didn't do anything about what they told you about? No. They raise funds. They, they raise up volunteers and groups and people to put action to what they know is true. Let's not be empathetic. Let's be compassionate. And that's why he goes on verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant. Ah, but the reality... The workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. He says there is a field that's white unto harvest. But we just don't have the manpower. We don't have the ability. He says, would you start praying that to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out workers into his vineyards? Are we willing to be a worker? I found in life that there are those who like to boss everybody around, and there are those that just don't mind doing the work because they don't want the responsibility of the leadership. Wherever you're at in that, how about let's humbling ourselves to be workers? You know, I found in life that sometimes it's easier to hold the ladder than the one climbing up to the top. The guy climbing up to the top gets the glory because he's the one that fixed it. But I found that sometimes the guy can't get up there unless there's somebody holding the ladder. Where are you at in that? Maybe God wants to use you. He says the fields are there. They're white unto harvest. But we just don't have enough people. Another question. So we talked about why is it important to share my faith? Well, God has commanded it. He's commanded us to love Him. And our love will really be our ultimate motive for doing what we are to do. And without it, someone is destined to hell. And the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who need Jesus Christ so they don't even understand that they need Jesus Christ. And there's a harvest. We understand why it's important to do it. So the second question is this. How should I explain my faith to others? Well, if you've been here at any amount of time at, at harvest, you know that I'm pretty simple about this. I do, I do believe in just a natural evangelism approach. Uh, I can remember... And I first became a pastor. I went from being a youth pastor to being a senior pastor. And uh, I got this information in the mail that will help your church and turn everybody in your church into soul winners. Man, I, sign me up, man. I mean, what pastor doesn't want his whole church to be soul winners? So I got this. I won't say the name, but there's a 12-step program to leading someone to Christ. Man, this thing was... I, I'm just telling you, I'm dumb as a box of rocks. I'm just, I'm just telling you. I, 12 steps? I can't remember the first three for... It's just beyond me. But there's 12 steps. So every Sunday night, we're going through this soul winning plan and 12 steps. And everybody, let's work on these together. You know, everybody's like, and everyone's looking at me like I'm just throwing a rock in their head. It's like, really? You want us to memorize 12 steps? Okay. Um, all right. This guy's young. He doesn't know what he's doing. Um, man, I put my heart into it. And I'm telling you, three months into it, I couldn't remember the first six in order. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just not brilliant like that. that. That's for other people. I struggled with it. And I'm thinking to myself, is really sharing our faith supposed to be this hard? Really? I mean, we're supposed to have a three-page testimony and then work it down to two pages and work it down to one page and get so you can share your story in 30 seconds and you do this, you'll be more effective at reaching the world for Christ and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just sitting there going, I am lost on this. I didn't know sharing, the, sharing my story was supposed to be this hard. Anyone else felt that way? You know what I think the simplest way 
to share your faith is simply telling someone else what Jesus Christ has done for you. I think that's scriptural. We all have a story. What were the circumstances of your story? Who did God use in bringing you to Christ? What scriptures impacted you to help you learn that you needed to know Jesus as your Savior? John chapter 4, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. You've heard the story 8,000 times, but don't tune it out because there's a couple of things here I want you to catch real quick. It says, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee, and he had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria, Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about the six in the evening. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Let me just stop right there for a moment. What was in common between Jesus and this woman at the well? Water. Water. Thank you. The bottom line is this. When we have points of contact in our lives with those around us that we have in common, those are the things that you use to bring in the gospel. You got a struggle? I got a struggle. You don't know how to get you through your struggle? I have Jesus to get me through my struggle. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. When there is a common point of interest... For Jesus, it was the water. We have an opportunity to turn a conversation towards the things of Jesus Christ. Naturally. Let's go on here. Verse 11. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket, and a well is deep, so where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. And Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him eternal life. What did he do? He got her attention. He took the thing that was common between them, her water, her need need of water, and his desire to have water, and said, wait a minute, there's a living water here. Take what is common between you and those around you. And turn it towards the things of Christ. For time's sake, I won't read the entire thing. But we know what happened here. She put her faith in Christ. You say, well, how do I know that? Well, let me read a couple verses here. Verse 16, or verse 15. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come in here and draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have answered correctly. I don't have a husband, she said, for you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on the mountain, yet you Jews uh, say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. So the woman is convinced in the next verse she says, I know that you are the Messiah. God got her attention using water. God spoke to her truth using something that was common between them. He says, I know that you are the Messiah who is called Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And she said, I, he says, I am he. Just then, the disciples turn back, and we see what happens is that he goes on to explain more to them and what his purpose in being here on earth is. But look at verse 39. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. Wait a minute. 
She didn't have time to get trained. She hasn't time to think about the fact that she was not supposed to know everything. I mean, she, she's, she's supposed to be scared and timid to do this. She doesn't know these things yet. Just, just, just sit a little longer. You'll, you'll get it. Just kind of keep quiet. No, she went out and told everybody what happened to her. I mean, think about that just for a moment. In fact, God's Word says something very interesting here in the passage. What did she come to the well for? To get... You know what she did when she got there and got the living water? She left her water pots. Wait a minute, you forgot what you came here to get. You left them behind. Why? Because God changed her life. And remember we said last week, when God enters our life, everything changes. She wasn't worried about the water anymore. She had the living water. And as soon as she got that, she left her water pots and went and began to tell everybody in the city. And it says that many more believe because of her testimony. Who might put their faith and trust in Christ? Who might begin to think about what Jesus could do for them if you were to open your mouth? In a daily conversation, a coworker, a friend, a neighbor, a relative. Verse 40 says, Therefore, when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this is really is the Savior of the world. It's not about you. You're just the messenger. The messenger points to the person who gave the message. Because we're ambassadors. It's his message. But we have a story. A story that we're to tell. So we know why it's important. How should we share our faith? Well, we could give you a million things. And I'm going to do that just for a second. I'll give you a couple ideas. But the reality is this. Simply tell someone else what's happened to you using God's Word. Number three, how can I start a conversation about my faith? I think there are two really easy ways to do that. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 26. There's a story here about King Agrippa. I'm just going to begin reading here. It says, Agrippa said to Paul, It is permitted for you to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that today I'm going to make a defense before you about everything I am accused of by the Jews, especially since you are an expert in all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem. They had previously known me for quite some time if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand on that, stand on trial for that, for the hope of the promise made of God to our fathers. The promise our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve him might, or night and day. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why is it considered incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself supposed it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus, the Nazarene. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had, not re had received authority for that from the chief priests. And when, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. In all the synagogues, I often tried to make them blaspheme by punishing them. I even pursued them to foreign cities since I was greatly enraged by them. Here's a man who said, I'm sharing my testimony. I'm sharing my story. There is evidence. There is proof. I had a reputation of not being a nice guy. King Agrippa, you've got to understand this. I have a reputation. Everybody knows my background. Everybody knows who I am. And I want you to know something about me. You've got to listen. Wait. Just listen patiently to me. He is sharing his story. Verse 12, I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with, with authority and a commission from the chief priest, King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice say, speaking to me in, in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? Then I said, who are you, Lord? Notice that he addressed them who, as to who he was. He knew who was getting his attention. He says, King Agrippa, you got to hear this story. It changed my life. Then he said, Lord, who are you? The Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. 
But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and what I will reveal to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them to open their eyes. And remember, we learned that the world has been, their eyes have been darkened. And he says, You're, this is the world that we live in. I don't think anything has changed from Paul's day to our day. Amen? We live in a world that does not understand Jesus Christ. And their eyes are darkened. And he says, Paul, I want you to go open their eyes so that they may turn from their darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that my faith but that by faith in me they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first, and those in Jerusalem, in the region of Judea, and the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. Think about that phrase. When we come to Jesus Christ, we repent of our past, and our whole actions change. Our purposes change. Repent and do works worthy of repentance. And it says, For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. To this very day I have obtained help that comes from God. And I stand and testify to both small and great, saying that nothing else than what the prophets and the Moses said would take place. That the Messiah must suffer, and that is the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to the people and to the Gentiles. Verse 24 is amazing. And as he was making his defense this way, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You're out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. Was he open to what Paul was saying? No. Can you control how people respond to what you say? No. Is it your job to control how people respond to what you say? No. Your job is to share your story. The story of Jesus Christ. Verse 28, look what he says. Actually, verse uh, 26. For the king knows about these matters. It is to him I am actually speaking boldly. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his notice, since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. He said, there's too much at stake here. There's too many testimonies. He goes, do you believe? I know you believe. Think about that. There's no question. Verse 29, or I'm sorry, verse 29, I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with a difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. He said, I want you all. I wish I wish I could make it turn out so that all of you would have the same faith that I've got. He's standing before the king and saying, I wish you had what I have. Except without these chains that I'm in. How do I start a conversation about my faith? Tell your story. Tell your story. It doesn't have to be difficult. So, verse 30, So the king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting with him got up, And when they had left, they had talked with each other and said, This man is doing nothing that deserves death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. He was suffering the consequences of his boldness. It's part of his story. How can I start a conversation about my faith? Real life stories. And I think oftentimes it's before and after testimonies. Kevin Brownfield said one time, a speaker friend of mine, he said, you either have a testimony or you're testifony. I thought it was kind of funny at first, but you know, it's really true. Because you can't be fake. If you're fake, it'll be revealed in the end. Testimony or testifony. If you have a testimony, then share it. If God has changed your life, then tell someone. If God has done a work in your life, let others see that. Asking questions. And can I say this? Avoid simple yes and no questions. Are you saved? Yes. Tell me about when you came to know Jesus Christ. Or tell me what you believe concerning Jesus Christ. What do you, what do you think about spiritual things? Do you believe in the afterlife? Uh, what, what do you believe about, about, about heaven or hell? Um, what do you believe concerning religion? See, yes and no questions are easy to avoid. But when you really want to have a conversation, you'll ask, open-ended questions that are not yes and no. 
and share your testimony. If you have one, if you know Jesus, you have a testimony. But let me just say this. You can't give away what you don't have. None of us can. You've heard me say that before. If I were a multimillionaire, I could give you thousands of dollars. But guess what? I'm not a multimillionaire. I can't give away what I don't have. If you have Jesus, share him. And then number four, what if someone wants what I have? Well, it's really simple. Tell them how they can have it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you who believe that you may what? Know that you have eternal life. That you may know that you have eternal life. I don't have to wish. I don't have to hope. I don't have to think. I don't have to guess about it. He says, these things have I written unto you who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. We have the answer. You can have the certainty. A know-so faith in Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter chapter 3, another familiar passage. Chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 says, But honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks of you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do it with great gentleness and respect, keeping your conscience clear, so that when you are at, accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. What if someone wants what you have? Be ready to share. Be ready to know how to answer that. How do I do that? Get in God's Word. What did God use in your life? What, what verses did God help you to realize and understand so that you might know Jesus Christ is your Savior? And I think, to me personally, there are, there are so many verses throughout Scripture, but we've, we can really bring it down to just a couple of verses. Romans 10, 9 and 10, and 13. Romans 10. I'm in Romans 9. Romans 10. Here we go. Verse 9 says this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. And verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If someone wants what you have, simply tell it to them. Make it simple. Simple enough that if a child can understand it, man, I was just a little kid when I came to know Jesus Christ. But that teacher put it in a way that I could understand it. And I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that Christ died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. And I knew that I had to put my, ask for forgiveness and put my faith and trust in him alone. It's that simple. Start a lifelong relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think all of us, God works in our, in our testimonies. And if we look at our testimony, God works in our lives in different ways. You know, there was a phrase that people used to always use, ask Jesus into your heart. Maybe that's a phrase you remember, but it is a phrase that God used to help you realize that you needed to pray and trust, put your trust in him. It was a common phrase when I was a younger kid. I don't know if you've used that phrase, another phrase, but here's what I want you to consider. If you don't know Jesus Christ... It is that simple. Admit that you're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. Every one of us. None of us can, can deny that. We're all sinners. A. Admit that I'm a sinner. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the price for that sin. Do you believe that Christ died for you? Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, what? Died for us. Christ Paid the price for our sin. And see, it says, For with a heart one believes, but with a mouth confession is made. Am I willing to confess my sins and call on him to be my Savior? It's really that simple. A, B, C. The bottom line is, we know the story. We know the message. What are we doing with it? I want to close with one last verse found in Luke chapter 15. Just a reminder, does my testimony make a difference? Can my testimony make a, make a difference? Can my testimony influence someone else? Yes, I believe it can. God can use any one of us to share our faith. Romans chapter 15 and verse 10. Just kind of a little icing on the cake here. He 
He says, I tell you in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. I don't know about you, but I'd love to see that rejoicing take place. Amen? Wouldn't that be cool? I don't know what that fully looks like. I really don't. But in my mind's eye, the rejoicing over, yes, there's another one who's put his faith and trust in Christ. And, there, and, and, and the action starts. Like They're all excited about it. It's better than someone winning a Super Bowl. It would be better than the Vikings winning a Super Bowl. It really would. I'd like to see that, but you know, I've got more hope in people coming to know Jesus. So that's where we put our hope, right? Amen? So here's the challenge today. Let's remove all the excuses. Let's remove all the justification as to why we don't do it. Let's start praying, saying, God, would you open up doors of opportunity and give me boldness to open my mouth as I should. Let's make that commitment. Close with this. A couple years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, somewhere in there, I talked about the 411 initiative. And it's just a simple little cliche that said this. Would there be four or five people, I called it the 511 initiative, five people that God would lay in my heart to pray for that need Jesus Christ? Pray for them for one minute once a day. 511. Five people that I could pray and ask God to give me a desire to see come to know Jesus Christ. Pray for him once a day for one minute. Does that seem difficult? I mean, what do you do for one minute a day? Let's start praying for those. See what God would do. I'm going to put you on the spot. How many will pray with that with me? I appreciate your honesty. If you don't, don't do it. I, honestly, it's cool. Let's make that commitment together as a church. Pray for five people once a day for a minute. See what God might do to see people come to know Jesus Christ. Let's pray.